Picture this. A memo is written by a hypothetical third-year associate. Memo has a few errors, nothing unexpected for a first draft of a memo regarding a standard legal issue. There are some spelling and grammatical errors, technical writing errors, and errors involving the analysis of the facts. This memo, in identical form, is sent to 60 law firm partners across the country, 23 women and 37 men. 39 are white and 21 are racial or ethnic minorities. All the partners are told that the memo is written by an associate named Thomas Meyer, an alum of NYU Law School. There's only one difference. 30 of the law firm partners are told that the memo was written by a white associate. The other 30 partners are told that the memo was written by a black associate. The partners are asked to grade the memo and provide feedback. Now the partners who are told that Thomas is white grade the memo on average 4.1 out of five. They say that Thomas is a generally good writer, that he has potential, and that he has good analytical skills. Now the partners who are told that Thomas is black rate the memo on average 3.2 out of five. They say that the memo needs a lot of work, is average at best, and that they can't believe Thomas went to NYU. An identical piece of written work product reviewed by law firm partners who are expert at evaluating the quality of such work is viewed entirely differently based on the lens of the race of the author. A critical yet troubling example of unconscious bias at work. Our pre-established notions about topics such as race and gender can make a fundamental difference in how we see the world and make decisions about others, including their potential for professional success. When we allow those notions to control our behaviors, attitude, and conduct, it impedes our ability to create a truly inclusive institution where the best talent can thrive. I'm here today to speak with you about three things. First, why should we care about diversity and inclusion? Second, what are the challenges to diversity and inclusion within our organizations? And third, what are the strategies we can all employ to advance diversity and inclusion? Now, all of you are leaders within your organizations. As in-house counsel, you are uniquely positioned to be a force for change. When the people within your organization seek your advice, when you're defining the legal structures and policies of your organization, when you're navigating the complicated legal framework that govern particular strategies, policies, or programs, you carry enormous influence. You are not only in a position to influence the legal paths of your organization, you are instrumental in driving the culture. In your role, you hold many of the levers that would allow for the creation of a more inclusive institution. But why should you care about diversity and inclusion? Well, there are several reasons. First, your organizations demand it. Your organizations are increasingly recognized that one of the critical factors to continued success is the ability to foster an inclusive environment. There are, of course, business reasons for this interest, which I will discuss momentarily, but the key thing to remember is that our organizations want this, and as a leader in your organization, you're tasked with finding a way to make this vision a reality. If your organizations are not currently demanding a more inclusive environment, then they risk falling behind. Second, success necessitates it. In order to have the best and brightest talent, you must, by necessity, have diversity. If you were to claim that you assembled the greatest baseball team in the country, but you only pick players from the New York Yankees, most reasonable people would tell you that you do not, in fact, have all the best players out there. And I'm not only saying that because I'm a Red Sox fan. By virtue of your own self-imposed constraint, You've limited your ability to assemble the best team that you can. There are major shifts that are happening as we speak and will continue to transform the nature of the US workforce. White men comprise only 17% of the global educated talent with a college degree or higher. By 2050, the labor force is expected to be 30% Latino as compared to 15% in 2010. Women today are attaining more college degrees than ever before and are projected to continue to outpace the competition. Millennials, whom we've heard plenty about, are the largest American generation at 75 million and are also the most diverse, with 44% being ethnically or racially diverse. Millennials will comprise 75% of the US workforce by 2025. Given the current changing demographics, a more successful workforce is naturally a more diverse workforce. 
We can only be the best if we can find and keep the best. More diverse teams lead to more organizational success. For example, research by McKinsey has affirmed the link between diversity and a company's financial performance. Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on their executive teams were 21% more likely to experience above average profitability than companies in the bottom quartile. Similarly, companies in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity were 33% more likely to experience above average profitability than companies in the bottom quartile. Gender, ethnic, and cultural diversity are all correlated with profitability. And in contrast, companies that are not diverse on these measures are more likely to underperform their industry peers on profitability by 29%. Third, your customers reflect it. As your organizations continue to grow and continue to serve a wider and wider spectrum of the population, they inherently serve a more diverse consumer base. The demographics of our country are rapidly shifting. We are becoming more diverse, and this diverse population spending power has increased substantially. U.S. multicultural buying power increased by 415% from 1990 to 2014. By 2060, the U.S. Census projects that the ethnic minority population in America will constitute nearly 60% of the total population, with Hispanic and Asian populations growing the fastest. Your organizations need to be able to serve this changing consumer base in a meaningful way. The only way to serve them is to understand them. You can only begin to understand them if your organization reflects them. And finally, perhaps most importantly, fairness requires it. With a more inclusive organization, your solutions will be better, your customers will be happier, and you'll be more successful. All of that is true. But at its very core, inclusion is really about fairness and equity. It's about creating an environment where everyone has the opportunity to succeed. In some ways, it is the most fundamentally American concept that every single one of us, given the chance, can make it, that we are not bound by our station in life, that we are not restricted by any caste or creed, that we are all blessed with the opportunity to be included in the pursuit of our happiness. By now, I hope you have fully understood the very real and very consequential benefits of inclusion. But so many of us, both law firms and in-house departments, continue to struggle. In fact, law firms and in-house legal departments are nearly identical in our current diversity composition. Only about 15% of our lawyer populations are racial or ethnic minorities. So, if inclusion is such a great thing, and we know it is, why haven't we all been able to achieve it? Because it's not easy. And what are the challenges to diversity and inclusion? There are several challenges that impede our ability to create more diverse and inclusive organizations. Now, the first challenge I want to talk about is unconscious bias. Yes, you've all heard about it, and yes, it's still a challenge. Unconscious biases are precognitive filters that help us interpret the wide variety of information that is coming at us at any given time. These biases are hidden, reflexive judgments that shape our perceptions of the world. They are formed by our experiences, beliefs, values, and associations. They are essentially cognitive shortcuts that make up the vast majority of our thoughts. And we are exposed to as many as 11 million pieces of information at any given time. And yet, our brains can only functionally deal with about 40. And we need these cognitive shortcuts to manage the volume of information. Now, there are a few myths about unconscious bias that need to be addressed. The first myth is that unconscious biases are not held by everyone. That's just not the case. Everyone has unconscious biases. We all have these filters that affect the way we interpret information around us. We all have biases that have developed from the totality of our life experience as our minds react to the stimuli around us. Now, the second myth is that unconscious bias equates to intentional discrimination. Also not true. In fact, I dislike the term unconscious bias because when people hear the word bias, they automatically think of something intentional. But unconscious bias is not in any way intentional discrimination. These biases happen without intention. They are outside the realm of our cognitive thought process. They operate behind a curtain, which we simply do not actively access. In some ways, unconscious bias is the Wizard of Oz of our brain 
pulling the levers and pushing the buttons that help us interpret and react to the world around us. The third myth is that unconscious bias is inherently bad. Also false. Biases are value neutral. They are simply a mechanism through which we interpret information. For example, I'm sure you've all had the experience of driving in a car for five, 10, or 15 minutes, and you come to the realization that you don't have any recollection of actually driving because your conscious mind was thinking of something else entirely. But somehow, you were able to interpret everything you needed to interpret in order to navigate your way. You braked when you needed to brake, stopped when you needed to stop, and turned where you needed to go. That's because we have these precognitive filters that help us interpret information and act upon it without conscious thought. These unconscious filters are essential traits for our survival. Now, all that said, unconscious biases can have detrimental consequences. The way in which we interpret information cognitively can affect things like our perceptions of others, our attitudes, and our behaviors. They can influence what we decide to give our conscious attention to, how we listen, and how we relate to people in certain situations. Acknowledging and understanding our unconscious biases and implicit responses is critical to informed decision-making and fairness. Now, there are several studies that demonstrate what happens when we fail to be aware of our biases. A study in the Harvard Business Review indicated that resumes with certain social class cues negatively impacted applicants despite their achievements. If a resume had what were considered higher class examples, such as a university athletic award, sailing team participation, or classical music, those resumes were viewed more favorably, regardless of GPA or other accomplishments. At the same time, if a resume contained what were considered lower class examples, such as having received a financial scholarship, association with being a first generation student, track and field, or country music, those resumes were viewed less favorably. Men in particular who had higher class social cues received more interviews, even controlling for more objective criteria. Wharton, Columbia, and NYU conducted a study to assess the prospects of students who wanted to pursue graduate school. For the study, emails were sent to approximately 6,000 faculty members across a range of disciplines. In these emails, the hypothetical students expressed an interest in talking to professors about research opportunities, becoming a graduate student, and learning about the professor's work. The email also requested a 10-minute discussion with the faculty member. The emails sent were identical in every way. The only difference was that the names of the hypothetical student differed. The sender's names were crafted to be racially identifiable. Names such as Brad Anderson, Latoya Brown, Juanita Martinez, Deepak Patel, and Mei Chen. The study found that faculty members were far more likely to respond to emails from white men. Strikingly, the response rates to emails from Asians was remarkably low. There was a 29 percentage point gap in the response rate between white men and Chinese women, and a 20 percentage point gap in responses from those with an Indian name. A study in Fortune looked at male and female high performers in the investment banking industry. Now, the goal of the study was to determine if there were any material differences in the way that these high performers were reviewed. The study found that only 2% of the reviews of the high performing men had any critical aspects, while 76% of the reviews of high performing women did. In particular, the study found that some of the same exact conduct that was praised in male reviews was criticized in female reviews. For example, being aggressive was noted as praiseworthy for men, but critical for women. There were also certain words that only appeared in female reviews. Words like bossy, abrasive, strident, emotional, and irrational. And what these studies all reflect is that our unconscious biases about things like race and gender can affect the ways we evaluate what would otherwise be objective criteria and performance. This means that we are potentially making suboptimal decisions about others who could be very strong performers for our teams and organizations. The second challenge I want to discuss is covering. Now, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was diagnosed with polio in his early 40s. The disease left him permanently paralyzed from the waist down. During his political pursuits and later as president, Roosevelt avoided being photographed in his wheelchair. He would meticulously plan his public appearances to avoid the press covering his arrival and departure 
which would have shown him needing assistance to get in and out of the car. While campaigning in September of 1932, he told the press, no movies of me getting out of the machine, boys. When traveling by train, he would appear on the rear platform of the railroad car, and when he boarded or disembarked, the private car was sometimes pushed to an area of the railroad yard away from the public so that no one would see him getting in or out. Now, in these efforts to hide his disability, Roosevelt wasn't engaging in passing, which is when someone attempts to hide an aspect of their identity that they perceive to be disfavored. It was public knowledge that Roosevelt suffered from polio and was disabled from the waist down. Instead, Roosevelt was engaged in covering. Professor Kenji Yoshino, who is well known for his analysis of the concept, defines covering as toning down a disfavored identity to fit into the mainstream. It is downplaying an identity that is already known to others. In other words, the identity is disclosed, but the individual seeks to mute its significance. Now, Yoshino has identified several famous examples of covering. Ramon Estevez changing his name to Martin Sheen in order to cover his ethnicity, or Margaret Thatcher training with a voice coach to lower the timbre of her voice in order to cover her status as a woman. Now, in the case of Roosevelt, Yoshino states that he played down his disability so people would focus on his more conventional presidential qualities. Roosevelt, like others who cover, was bowing to an unjust reality that required him to tone down his stigmatized identity to get along in life. There are several broad types of covering, appearance, affiliation, advocacy, and association. Covering related to appearance refers to altering one's self-presentation, which can include grooming, attire, and mannerisms in order to blend into the mainstream. For example, a black woman may not be comfortable with her natural hairstyle and rather adjust it in some way to make it closer to the mainstream. Covering related to affiliation refers to individuals avoiding behaviors that are associated with their identity, often to negate stereotypes about that identity. For example, a first-generation professional may not volunteer that he or she grew up in a low-income household or that he or she was the first to go to college because of fear of being rejected. Covering related to advocacy refers to how much individuals stick up for their group. For example, a woman may decide not to bring up gender issues at all, even though such issues may be prevalent and personally meaningful to her. And covering related to association relates to individuals avoiding contact with other group members. For example, an individual who is gay may decide not to bring their significant other to work events or avoid mentoring people who are also gay. Now, a Deloitte study found that 61% of people cover along at least one axis. People who identified as LGBTQ, Black, Hispanic, or women covered at higher than average rates, between 63% and 83%. However, covering is not limited to underrepresented groups. Even straight white men engage in covering, for example, by dyeing one's hair if it turns gray, or dis not disclosing one's religious or political beliefs. The Deloitte study found that approximately 45% of straight white men covered in some way. And the reason that many groups feel pressure to cover is because of our social contracts. For example, we saw above with the unconscious bias example, women and minorities are acutely aware of how they are treated differently and how their performances are viewed differently when viewed through the lens of their race, gender, or sexual orientation. This experience creates enormous pressure to cover and downplay those characteristics. As such, the drive to cover is not based on an unfounded or oversensitive reaction to one's environment. Rather, it is based on a realistic assessment and an understanding of consequences. Now, covering is detrimental. It takes an enormous amount of energy to cover. It is damaging to one's sense of self. It can significantly decrease one's sense of opportunity within an organization and it can significantly decrease one's commitment to an organization. This is devastating to our ability to foster inclusion within our organizations. We spend so much time, energy, and resources in hiring, training, and developing our talent. If, because of covering, those that are historically underrepresented cannot perform at their best and have lower sense of opportunity with and commitment to the organization, it should be no surprise that such individuals will not develop and remain at rates similar to others and consistent with their abilities. Now, the third challenge, social isolation. As we build a more diverse workforce at our respective organizations, 
we naturally have a larger percentage of traditionally underrepresented minorities. However, until our institutions are thoroughly diverse, we have to confront the challenge faced by underrepresented minorities in an environment that doesn't completely reflect their backgrounds. Being in an environment where you are underrepresented can have negative consequences on your performance. There are different ways in which this can play out. For example, underrepresented minorities may have a more difficult time finding mentors, may struggle with securing the best growth opportunities, may not receive the same quality of feedback, may have less of an opportunity to spend time with senior members of an organization, or may struggle in connecting with their counterparts. Social isolation can be a barrier to success for underrepresented minorities because it creates distance in relationships. Without the same opportunities and access as their peers, underrepresented minorities are set at a disadvantage in progressing through their institutions. Now, the fourth challenge I want to talk about is the gender confidence gap. Women's historical underrepresentation, particularly in leadership roles in corporate America, coupled with the factors we've already discussed, the effects of unconscious bias, covering, and social isolation, have led to another phenomenon facing women in the workplace, the gender confidence gap. Studies have shown that men tend to overestimate their ability and performance, and women tend to underestimate both, whereas the performances themselves do not differ in quality. For example, women are generally much more reluctant to make asks in all situations, including during salary negotiations, which men are four times more likely to initiate. A Hewlett-Packard study looked at personnel records to determine when people were applying for promotions. It found that women applied for promotions only when they believed they met 100% of the job requirements. Men applied when they believed they could meet 60% of the job requirements. And we should keep these statistics in mind when thinking about who to offer the next opportunity to and whether we need to be more proactive in developing those we supervise. Don't mistake silence for lack of ambition or competence. That's often not the case, and you could miss great talent by overlooking those who are less outspoken. We know that the challenges to inclusion are several and well-documented. They are often inherent and systemic. Were there an easy solution, it would have already been identified and deployed. But there is no easy solution. Rather, the commitment to create a more inclusive organization requires hard work and ongoing attention. And we can begin that hard work by directing our efforts to critical junctures, hiring, staffing, and evaluations and feedback, where key decision-making and progression occurs. It is at these key junctures where letting our guard down can put someone on the less desired path. And once they head in that direction, it becomes increasingly difficult to course correct. Instead, if we can mitigate the challenges of unconscious bias, covering, social isolation, and the gender confidence gap at these key markers, we significantly improve our ability to create a more inclusive environment. First, hiring. While some of you may not have as regular a hiring process as a law firm, every opportunity to hire is an opportunity to change the institution. While the volume of that change at any particular institution may be small, the incremental changes of all institutions working together can be tremendous. Many small steps can lead to one giant leap. There are a number of tools you can use during interviews to mitigate biases. First, ask candidates to tell you something about themselves that is not apparent from their resume. Surprising information can disrupt and weaken our biases. Ask open-ended questions and specific questions about accomplishments and experiences, which will help draw out candidates who are less confident or soft-spoken. Pick one or more questions to use with all candidates so you can elicit comparable information and ensure a fair review across the slate. Show interest in a candidate's personal background and interest, especially if they are different from yours. This will help boost the candidate's confidence, increase their engagement, and create space for them to be authentic. Avoid the halo effect, tending to see someone in glowing terms if they went to a particular school or have some other notable association and limit the reliance on your gut reaction. While it is important to listen to your gut, of course, sometimes this reaction can prevent you from an objective assessment of a candidate. Second, staffing. In your institutions, you may be working with relatively small teams, at least compared to other teams within the institution, and so your staffing decisions may be more limited. However, again, small adjustments can add up to big change and a more inclusive approach. 
When considering how to assign responsibilities amongst the members of your team, consider the full breadth of your team. You should regularly assess whether you're dividing up projects and opportunities in an equitable manner. Unconsciously, you may be assigning particular growth opportunities to one or two people to the exclusion of others. This may be because those individuals are explicitly asking for those opportunities or because others are noticeably silent in their demands for those opportunities. But try not to let your staffing decisions be necessarily dictated by volume or frequency of those requesting particular opportunities. Rather, take a step back and consider your division of labor, both in the short and long term, so you can carefully assess whether everyone on your team is getting the same shot and the same growth opportunities. Third, evaluations and feedback. It is important to give regular feedback to everyone on your team, including both positive and constructive feedback. Your team members need to understand what they are doing well and, perhaps more importantly, how they can improve. If constructive feedback is not conveyed and the employee continues on that same track, it will simply increase the distance between you and that employee. It will deter you from giving that individual certain growth opportunities because you are reluctant about their ability to handle it. And it will increase your workload since you'll be less likely to delegate. That gulf will continue to widen to the point where mutual resentment sets in. Moreover, when you are thinking about providing feedback to someone on your team, consider whether you would provide the same feedback for that person to have a different identity or be part of a different group. In your feedback, focus on specific accomplishments, objective experience, and concrete examples of strengths and weaknesses. If you think someone on your team lacks ambition or confidence, is soft-spoken or tentative, has low energy, or does not quite fit within the organization, consider how unconscious bias, social isolation, covering, or the gender confidence gap might be influencing your perceptions. Fourth, Develop your skills as an inclusive leader. In addition to employing some or all of the strategies I've already covered, you should consider other ways to further develop your skill set as an inclusive leader. Consider the following. Reflect on your commitment to diversity and inclusion and recognize that your belief in this work aligns with your personal values. Inclusion is more than just the business case. It is about fairness, opportunity, and equity. Become an advocate by educating other leaders to broaden engagement and buy-in at your organization. Be mindful of your personal biases and your organization's blind spots by considering whether current processes, protocols, or aspects of organizational culture leave too much room for unconscious bias to affect decision-making about others. Ask questions, actively listen, and reserve judgment. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, be collaborative. Empower your team members and create a cohesive environment. Create an environment where individuals feel safe to share their diverse perspectives. Ensure that all team members are equally included and proactively engaged to reduce any isolation. Encourage autonomy and empower your teams by leading from the middle. These are some of the strategies that we can all employ. Many of these adjustments only require a more mindful approach to how we think how we operate, how we react. Mindfulness can make monumental differences on our teams and in our institutions. I know that we're all extraordinarily busy, and the busier we get, the less time we might think we have for mindfulness. But it's precisely when we are at our busiest, when we feel that we don't have time, when we feel that the workload is simply too much, that mindfulness is more important because it is during those times where we become more vulnerable to misstep. If we set our sights on a more mindful approach at all times, we can make inclusion truly possible. As I mentioned at the outset, all of you are leaders within your organization. In your roles as legal counsel to your institutions, you have a monumental opportunity and responsibility. But I also recognize that your institutions are large and that it feels almost overwhelming to understand how you might be able to bring about fundamental widespread and lasting change. But here's the thing, creating true inclusion starts with each one of us. We can all build inclusion by taking small, easy to implement steps. Hopefully some of the strategies I've shared resonate with you and feel doable. And remember why inclusion is so important and worthy of our time and dedication. It's important because it's a core tenet of our organization's cultures. 
It's critical to recruiting, retaining, and developing the best and brightest talent. It's critical to the ability of our teams to deliver the best results for our customers and clients. And our shared commitment to fairness and equality demands it. Thank you. As you might expect from its name, implicit bias can be hard to spot. Let me start by giving you a few examples of implicit bias that have been uncovered in recent studies. When whites and African Americans were sent to bargain for a used car, African Americans were offered initial prices roughly $700 higher and they received far smaller concessions. A regularly repeated study by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development sent African Americans and whites to look at apartments and found that African Americans were shown fewer apartments to rent and houses for sale. White state legislators were found to be less likely to respond to constituents with African American names. This was true of legislators in both political parties. Emails sent to faculty members at universities asking to talk about research opportunities were more likely to get a reply if a stereotypically white name was used. Even eBay auctions were not immune. When iPods were auctioned on eBay, researchers randomly varied the skin color on the hand holding the iPod. A white hand holding the iPod received 21% more offers than a black hand holding the same iPod. Now that we have discussed a few examples of implicit bias, next, I would like to know your immediate reaction to seeing this symbol. Now hopefully, your immediate reaction to seeing this would be stop, right? If not, then you may want to retake your driver's test. But again, the first thing that you think of is stop, which is a completely reasonable and expected reaction. I use this stop sign example to segue into some good news and bad news. Personally, I like to start with the bad news first. The bad news is that we all have implicit biases. The good news is that while we all have implicit biases, we can change the way that we react to these biases. Here's what we will cover today. First, we will define what implicit bias is and where it comes from. Second, we will discuss why implicit bias is problematic, especially in the legal field. Third, I will provide you with specific and actionable advice on how to recognize and prevent the negative implications of implicit bias. First, let's go over a few key terms that will help you with your understanding of this topic. The first term is a simple one, bias. Bias means a prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way to be considered unfair. For example, hiring a man over a more qualified woman. The next term is stereotype. This word is probably familiar to most of us, but the official definition of a stereotype is an association between a given object and a specific attribute. Some stereotypes are seemingly harmless, like lawyers are amazing people, but a lot of them can be very harmful. Up next is the word implicit, which means that we are either unaware of or mistaken about the source of the thought or feeling, as opposed to explicit, which means that we are aware that we have a particular thought or a feeling. Now we get to the more recently discussed terms, microinequity and microaggression. A microinequity is a slight that demeans or marginalizes the recipient. For example, saying good morning to everyone except for one person or routinely excluding a colleague from team events such as getting coffee or drinks after work. On the other hand, a microaggression is an act that stereotypes or denigrates the recipient. For instance, telling someone that they don't sound black or I never would have guessed that you were gay. A microaggression is basically making assumptions about how a person will behave because of the way that they look. Finally, what is implicit bias? Implicit bias is a type of mental shortcut. Think back to the red stop sign or symbol earlier. We all create mental shortcuts or associations with symbols to help us process all the information that we encounter every day. These can be helpful in some situations, like when we see a stop sign. We may not see the word stop, 
but we've created a mental shortcut that big red octagon means to stop. But the problem is when those mental shortcuts lead to discriminatory behavior. Everyone has some implicit biases. It is an impression of a group often operating outside of our awareness based on stereotypes and attitudes that we hold. These attitudes and stereotypes tend to develop early in life and strengthen over time. Our implicit biases may substantially differ from the stereotypes and attitudes that we think we hold or self-report. But having an implicit bias does not mean that you act with that bias, and it does not make you a bad person. But where do these biases come from? The answer is everywhere. They come from the messages that we are exposed to from the media and interactions with the people that we trust. The world is a constant stream of information that we sometimes unknowingly process and store. Sources of unconscious bias include family, friends, school, stereotypes in the media, and the observations and assumptions that you make yourself. Implicit associations form early and quickly, so we are usually unaware of when they are being formed. For example, take a look at this picture. Which person in this photo is more likely to become CEO? You don't have to say your answer aloud, but think about it and think about what your answer was and why. Also, something else to consider. Less than 15% of American men are over six feet tall, yet nearly 60% of all CEOs are over six feet tall. Next, take a look at this picture. If you were being audited by the IRS and needed a good accountant, which of the people pictured here would you pick? Who would be your last choice? Then say, for instance, you needed a lawyer. Which of the people pictured would you pick and why? Again, think about your immediate answer and why that is your answer. Be honest with yourself. As you can see, we all have implicit biases. So I know what you are probably thinking. Well, if we all have implicit biases and don't know when they are being formed, how do we know our own biases? Easily, through taking tests. For instance, the implicit association test, which measures the strength of associations between concepts like race and gender, and evaluations or stereotypes by measuring the associations between the two concepts. The test can identify attitudes and beliefs that people may be unwilling or unable to report because they may not be aware that they implicitly hold certain attitudes or beliefs. The test subject is asked to quickly sort words or faces into categories and answer a topic-specific questionnaire. The score is then calculated based on how well the test subject can complete the assigned tasks. The implicit association test exists for a wide range of topics, like skin tone, race, age, sexuality, disability, and ethnicity. Here are a few sample questions from one of the tests. Respondents are asked to read the questions and answer with responses such as strongly agree, somewhat agree, neither agree nor disagree, somewhat or strongly disagree. In 2014, the Washington Post summarized responses from 1.5 million white participants who took the implied association test based on race this test for bias against African Americans. This map shows the scores from that study. The darker the red, the higher the level of bias. The darker the blue, the lower the level of bias. This is the kind of information that we are able to glean from the implicit association test. And the more that we are aware of our biases, the better equipped that we are to deal with those biases in a positive manner. This test is available on Harvard's website under the term Project Implicit. Let's take a look now at the legal landscape, law firms in particular. According to a 2017 report by the Vault Minority Corporate Council Association, law firms are comprised of 83.6% white attorneys. Let's ponder on that for a second. 
This means that for every 10 attorneys at a law firm, at least eight of them are white. The numbers change even more when looking at the demographics of partners. As of 2017, 90.79% of all partners were white. 3.32% were Asian Americans, 2.64% were Hispanic or Latino, 1.97% of them were African Americans, less than 1% were Native Indian or Pacific Islander, and less than 2% of them were openly LGBTQ or individuals with disabilities. The statistics are even worse in the equity partnership ranks. Indeed, from 2007 to 2015, there has been very little change in the racial demographics of law firm partners. Although the three largest minority groups represent 21% of associates, they only represent 8% of partners. There is a similar trend when it comes to LGBTQ attorneys. As of 2016, LGBTQ attorneys make up 3.24% of associates, but at the partner level, they only make up 1.89%. In terms of gender in big law, women are doing better than they have in the past, but there is still work to be done. Although women make up a majority of law students and 48% of associates, as of 2017, only 19% of equity partners are women, and only 2% of them are women of color. In short, there are more women entering the legal field and becoming associates, but as we look at partnership rates, the number of women severely narrows. The same is true for attorneys of color, except that there are still disproportionate numbers of attorneys of color and LGBTQ attorneys entering law firms. Even though the number of attorneys of color continues to grow, their attrition rates for attorneys of color continue to be higher than their white peers. The same goes for women versus their male counterparts. But why do attrition rates even matter? Well, let's talk money. When an attorney departs, it costs the firm anywhere from $400,000 to $800,000. In fact, the 400 largest law firms in the United States lose roughly $9.1 billion annually due to turnover loss. I understand that this is a lot of information and numbers to remember, but if there is one thing that you should be able to recall, it is why all of this is important, why all of this matters. First and foremost, diversity in the workplace is the fair and right thing to do. Homogenous workplaces stifle growth and productivity, and clients increasingly expect diverse teams to work on their matters. Second. Diversity matters because client expectations are changing. A trend has taken hold in the legal industry where in-house legal departments of some of the country's most prominent companies have begun demanding teams composed of diverse individuals to be staffed on their matters. The message is becoming increasingly clear. Those who fail to embrace diversity risk losing money and clients. The American Bar Association's Resolution 113 is named Promoting Diversity in the Legal Profession. The resolution urges providers of legal services to expand and create opportunities at all levels of responsibility for diverse attorneys. It also urges purchasers of legal services, especially corporate and government legal departments, to direct a greater percentage of the legal services they purchase to diverse attorneys. General counsels have overwhelmingly signed on to the resolution, including general counsels from American Express, CVS Health Company, Walmart, Verizon, and many more. Overall, implicit bias results in more than just statistics. It affects the lives and experiences of real people every day. For instance, attorneys of color have experienced the following. Being asked to participate in a client pitch, but not given an opportunity to work on the matter. They have been asked in a meeting to identify the person in charge because it was assumed that they were court reporters or other staff. Latino lawyers are assumed to speak Spanish and are faced with questions about their immigration status. Asian American men were classified as engineers or assumed to have an engineering background, while Asian American women reported being stereotyped as either too docile or a dragon lady. 
African-American attorneys were subjected by non-African-Americans to comments to the effect of, the black thing really gives you an in. There are also common biases related to gender in the legal profession. Female attorneys of color reported they had been mistaken for administrative staff, court personnel, or janitorial staff at a level 50% greater than white men, and reported that they have had equal access to high quality assignments at a level 28% lower than white men. White women reported that their commitment or competence was questioned after they had children at a level 36% higher than white men. I know that all of these statistics and information can make these seem fairly bleak. Thus enters some good news. We can do something about it. And by listening to this presentation, you've already taken the first step. So feel free to give yourself a pat on the back. But seriously, the first step is education and awareness. It is important to know that implicit bias exists and what biases you possess. This isn't the easiest thing to do by yourself, so there are resources to help you recognize and address your biases. One has already been mentioned, which is the implicit association test that you can find on Harvard's website under Project Implicit. Remember, this test will help you identify attitudes and beliefs that people might be unwilling or unable to report because they may not be aware that they hold these attitudes or beliefs. To really get a feel for the importance of assessments like this one, let's watch this video. This is an awareness test. How many times does the team in white pass the ball? If you answered 13 passes, you are correct. But did you see the moonwalking gorilla? As you can see from this video, we often don't notice things if we are not looking for them. That is why it is important to identify and recognize our implicit biases if we want to avoid explicit discrimination. When you identify and acknowledge your personal biases, you can also understand what triggers them. After understanding what triggers your biases, your motivation to be fair is what matters because your biases can be changed especially when a person is motivated to be fair and unbiased, which brings us to the second step, which is mindfulness. Recognizing our implicit biases can provide motivation to change them. Studies also show that people who pay attention to their assumptions and challenge them can start to change those assumptions. Mindfulness is a stare, not a blink which means that some decisions require a more explicit kind of thinking rather than an immediate decision. Another important factor to consider is exposure. Exposure, contact, and positive exemplars and environment are incredibly important. Surround yourself with a diverse array of cultural and social situations and individuals. This allows you to reduce your biases because you are actively increasing exposure to counter stereotypical exemplars and finding commonalities with other people. Commonalities help you identify something that places you in the same group as the other person and find some common ground. Here's an example of what may happen when firms and workplaces do not address or recognize implicit bias in the workplace. A certain firm was recently under fire after releasing this picture of its new partner class. As the photo announcement made its rounds on LinkedIn, one lawyer posted that she was inspired to require a diversity check of all service providers as a condition of continued relationships. Other in-house counsel said they were dismayed by the homogeneity of this set of new partners and called the announcement very disappointing. While the particular law firm deleted the post and promised to do better, there were articles written about the post from Above the Law, 
the New York Law Journal, and the ABA Law Journal. It sparked another conversation about the lack of diversity in promotions within the legal field. What made this even more eye-opening for some was the fact that this law firm ranked in the top 25 most diverse law firms for the last 15 years. If this is part of the best that we are as a profession, we must do better. On an organizational level, you can take charge of arranging implicit bias training for your team. For some of you, it may be helpful to keep a mental objective framework to assess your thinking. This will help you limit implicit bias by allowing more time to objectively consider decisions. Externally, there must be procedural and organizational changes to disrupt the link between implicit bias and discriminatory behavior. For example, O'Melveny & Myers offers an example of a law firm attempting to reduce implicit bias in its hiring process by using a software tool called Pymetrics. The software evaluates summer associate candidates based on a range of traits and uses an algorithm to suggest the best suited candidates without regard to gender, racial, or ethnic biases. Another tool called Work uses data about individual employees to assess how and when flexible schedules will benefit them and their needs, rather than instituting a broad generic policy for alternative schedule arrangements. Change procedures are also made more effective when an organization holds its member accountable in order to reinforce those changes. Another helpful tool is the ABA Diversity and Inclusion Toolkit, which helps organizations evaluate their diversity and inclusion efforts. The toolkit provides guidance in understanding implicit bias, providing examples of where implicit biases thrive and how they exist. They also provide tools that help you and others catch and correct snap decision making that may be linked to harmful implicit biases and make a conscious effort not to exhibit such bias. The toolkit is available on the ABA website and includes links to other helpful websites. I also cannot stress enough the power of in-house attorneys to affect change. Like the general counsels at various large companies that signed on to the ABA resolution, in-house attorneys can do the same thing. Putting pressure on your own companies to set diversity standards for outside counsel will encourage firms to take a look at the demographics of their teams to ensure that they are incorporating diverse attorneys and viewpoints. The realization of the diversity issues that continue to plague the legal industry. Recognition of this issue has given birth to the Mansfield Rule. The Mansfield Rule was inspired by the NFL's Rooney Rule, which requires every NFL team to interview at least one minority candidate for head coach vacancies. As a result of the Rooney Rule, the number of minorities hired to fill head coach positions doubled within a few years after its implementation. The Mansfield Rule borrows from the Rooney Rule by measuring the consideration for participation in client pitch meetings and requesting that participating law firms make appointment and election processes transparent to all lawyers in their firms. The goal of the rule is to boost the representation of diverse lawyers in law firm leadership by broadening the pool of candidates considered for these opportunities. The Mansfield Rule and the subsequent certification has garnered the support of many companies, including 3M, Cargill, Walmart, and many more. When planning unconscious bias training for your organization, there are a few things to consider to ensure that your training is effective. You should make sure three factors are present, balance, structure, and action. First is balance. The training must strike an effective balance between limiting defensiveness about unconscious bias while communicating the importance of managing bias. Oftentimes when members of the majority group hear unconscious bias or are told that they have unconscious bias, they may think that you are accusing them of racism or sexism and get defensive. Effective training shows participants that we have unconscious biases not because we're bad people, but because we are people. Training should highlight the different ways that unconscious bias creeps into all aspects of our lives and not just in ways that negatively impact diversity. It is also important not to normalize the unconscious bias, but rather show how prevalent biases are in our lives in order to address them accordingly. Second is structure. It is important to structure the training around workplace situations. 
Sometimes it is difficult for people to imagine themselves exhibiting implicit bias in the workplace because most people hopefully try to put their best foot forward in the workplace. But as we have seen from this entire presentation, so far the workplace is rife with implicit bias. Studies show that trainings that focus on workplace situations is more relevant and memorable for participants. You can incorporate such situations by addressing them in day-to-day -day work, day-to-day -day recruiting, hiring, team dynamics, and career development. Under these scenarios, this will allow participants to reflect on their own experiences and behaviors in the workplace. Third, and the most important point, is action. The training must be action-oriented, or else why does it matter? All of the information is useless unless people are given strategies to manage their biases. Effective training must equip trainees with action-oriented strategies. Let's go over some, shall we? The hiring process is where everyone begins their relationship with the employer. So it is important that bias is dealt with during the hiring process. When focusing on eliminating implicit bias in the interview process, potential strategies include asking all candidates the same questions to limit the assumptions that can present themselves in the form of well-intentioned questions. Also, being aware of the signals that you give as an individual. Small gestures like negative facial expressions when a certain colleague speaks or dismissing the idea of one person only to embrace it when offered by another or continuously mispronouncing someone's name. For instance, the law firm that I mentioned earlier decided to remedy their partner class photo debacle by holding a town hall. This was a great first step in addressing the issue. However, this was the email sent to associates and counsel. Let's all think for a minute about what could have been changed within this email. It helps that it is already circled, but yes, there are quotation marks around the word diversity. Although they are two little quotation marks, they have a substantial impact on how this email is read and received. It can read as sarcastic or disingenuous. An associates or counsel that may have been looking forward to addressing issues regarding diversity within the firm may feel discouraged. While the sender's intentions may have been pure and sincere, these are the little things that can hinder openness within a workplace. Think of the small signals of implicit bias that may act as quotation marks in your individual interactions and ways that you can remove them. Eliminating these actions are small steps towards creating a better work environment and combating your own implicit biases. As a part of these actions, it is important to track workplace progress. For example, in the Mansfield certification process, firms were expected to create and adopt documentation and tracking norms to measure their progress and identify their areas for improvement. This was so firm leaders could compare their past, current, and future pipelines to determine whether they were making progress on increasing the representation of diverse lawyers considered for and ultimately advanced into leadership positions. Tracking and measuring this kind of progress is an important part of eliminating bias. Seeing your progress will boost morale, but if you are not making positive strides, tracking your progress will signal a need to reevaluate the systems that you have in place and find new ways to improve representation of diverse lawyers. One last point to remember is that you can't change what you can't see. This quote is a lesson in micro-messaging. Educate yourself and the people around you about implicit bias and the subtle and explicit ways that they can appear in everyday life. Create an environment that fosters less silence in the face of discrimination. Of course, the changes will not come overnight. Changes will take time through education and being intentional in our thoughts and behaviors. Recently, the American Bar Association has created a new project called the Bias Interrupters Project designed to reduce the negative and long-standing effects of bias in law firms and corporate legal departments. The project includes toolkits that provide easily implementable and measurable tweaks to existing workplace systems to interrupt racial and gender bias in law firms and in-house departments. I think the name Bias Interrupters is perfect because it does not imply or ask for individuals to be heroes, but ask for us as a profession to interrupt bias in the many forms. 
If we work together to do this, we can make the legal field a space where people are able to thrive without concerns about race, gender, sexuality, or other immutable characteristics. As this talk comes to a close, I hope that you were able to learn something today that you can take back to your respective workplaces, homes, and communities. As many great leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr. once quoted, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Let's all do our part to help it bend. Thank you.